Welcome to Diagnostic Imaging's Weekly Scan. I'm Whitney Palmer, Senior Editor. Before we get to our interview this week with renowned urologist Dr. Lawrence Klotz about the growing role of microultrasound in prostate cancer detection and how it compares to multiparametric MRI, here are the top stories of the week. As research continues, we are learning more and more about the relationship between COVID-19 and stroke. In a new study published in the American Journal of Roentgenology, Investigators from Mount Sinai ICANN School of Medicine determined that patients who come to the emergency department with neurological symptoms face a 2.4 times greater likelihood that they will experience a large vessel occlusion stroke than people who are not infected with the virus. By reviewing neuroimaging scans from 329 patients between March 16 and April 30 of this year, the team found that 38.3% of patients for whom providers initiated a stroke code were also positive for the virus, and 62% of those patients experienced large vessel occlusion strokes involving the M1, M2 segments of the middle cerebral artery. Based on this information, the team urged providers to pay closer attention to COVID-19 positive patients who have neurological symptoms and to lower the threshold for initiating a stroke code. In addition, Research published this week in JAMA Cardiology highlights that 78% of patients who have COVID-19 and recover have lingering heart damage even after they enter recovery, regardless of any pre-existing conditions or the severity of their disease. These results seen on MRI scans identify the presence of ongoing inflammation in the heart muscles and the heart lining that point to myocarditis and pericarditis. By examining three T MRI scans from an unselected cohort of 100 patients, a team of German investigators found that 78% of patients had abnormal cardiac findings, including raised myocardial native T1 in 73% of patients and increased myocardial native T2 in 60% of patients. In addition, they found detectable high sensitivity troponin in 76% of patients as well as myocardial late gadolinium enhancement in 32% and pericardial enhancement in 22% of patients. Overall, the team said, these findings point to a long-term lingering impact of COVID-19 that could affect the future of patient care. In non-COVID-19 news, investigators from the University of Washington School of Medicine published a study in JAMA Network Open this week that revealed that not all women benefit from digital breast tomosynthesis. Although the screening technique is known for improved cancer detection and the reduction of recall rates, the researchers discovered that the 10% of women who have extremely dense breast tissue do not experience those outcomes, raising a concern for undetected and therefore untreated breast cancers. The team examined more than 1.5 million breast exams, including 1.27 digital mammograms and 310,000 3D mammograms, and they found improved cancer detection rates as well as a drop in recall rates across all age groups examined. They also found that a higher biopsy recommendation rate was associated with 3D mammography. Ultimately, investigators said, providers should apply these findings to determining which patients would benefit the most from digital breast tomosynthesis and which patients should stick with digital mammography. For pediatric imaging, researchers from Nemours Children's Health System in Florida published guidance to help you maximize the use and safety of pediatric CT angiography. As always, these tips are guided by the Image Gently and Image Wisely campaigns. Overall, the team offered pearls of wisdom in 10 areas, knowing your patient, scanner, and clinical context, scan timing, IV access and contrast material risks, the importance of a saline chaser, gantry rotation time and pitch, kilovoltage setting, tube current, scan direction, post-processing, and dual or single bolus techniques. Their details, and their guidance are published in the American Journal of Roentgenology. And finally this week, Diagnostic Imaging spoke with Dr. Lawrence Klotz, former chief of the Division of Urology at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and former president of the Canadian Neurological Association, and his colleague, Dr. Brian Wadlinger, director of research and clinical projects at Exact Imaging about the use of microultrasound in detecting prostate cancer and the role that it could play in supplementing multiparametric MRI in searching for and more easily detecting the disease. Here's what they shared. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Klotz and Dr. Wadlinger for joining me today. I really appreciate it. To, to jump in and kind of start at a beginning level, walk us through the, the difference between micro ultrasound and multi-parametric MRI. You know, what are the differences in how these, these two uh, test modalities function? Well, you know, it, probably the best way to answer that is to start with the difference between conventional ultrasound and micro ultrasound. So the difference is uh, six to nine megahertz for conventional versus 29 megahertz for micro ultrasound and 200 micron resolution for conventional versus 70 micron resolution for the high resolution. So the advantage of the high resolution 70 micron uh, parameter is that you can see alteration in prostatic ductal anatomy because 70 microns about the diameter of a prostatic duct. So uh, prostate cancer, particularly higher grade prostate cancer, is characterized by uh, an alteration, basically deterioration in the quality of the prostatic ducts. And so it's a very early signal with higher grade prostate cancer to get changes in the ductal anatomy. And that's the basis for the restricted diffusion on MRI. So as the, as the ducts uh, deteriorate in quality and size, the cells are packed more tightly together, the water diffusion diminishes and you get a signal or is restricted and you get a signal. Where with ultrasound, it's quite analogous. So the, the uh, loss of ductal structure is seen, you can see it. So the principle is quite similar to MRI. And uh, the, the issues like the, the sensitivity and specificity uh, you couldn't really predict that just based on the physical parameters, but that's what this publication was, really a first look at how the sensitivity and specificity compares to MRI, and it looks really quite encouraging. Well, before we jump into the specifics of the paper, um, given that you know MRI exists, and you said that there are some similarities between these two, how do you see micro ultrasound coming into play with MRI? Is it going to be a, a oh, I, would, yeah. I would say there's two major issues. The first issue is the whole issue of cost, accessibility, the diffusion of expertise, access to MRI. So MRI, I, I think, uh, you know, everyone knows this. It's a quite an expensive technology. Um, uh, in Canada, we are, I would say, under underserviced with MRI nationally. Uh, and so patients, there's, there's quite a long wait for patients to get MRI, particularly when it comes to elective indications, of which I would say this is one. Uh, and so there, there's an issue of access and cost with the MRI as well as expertise. So we know that particularly in the diagnostic pathway that is currently evolving, and this, the, the whole thing is changing dramatically as we speak. Up till now, prostate cancer was diagnosed with systematic biopsy. Basically, going forward, the imaging is gonna come first. And that's already happened in many places in Europe and United States, not quite yet in Canada, although it, it's going to, I think. Um, but, you know, it creates a real problem. How do you provide that huge volume of MRIs to, for example, every patient with an elevated PSA? And in many parts of the world, I think it's, it's really inaccessible for a cost reason, in the developing world, for example. So the appeal of ultrasound is it's, in comparison, relatively inexpensive and relatively uh, cheap. Once you have the device, the actual uh, cost of the procedure is, 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 is negligible. I mean, it's, it's basically the time of the operator. Uh, whereas with MRI, you know, you have a fairly hefty kind of hourly MRI rate. So it's appealing in that regard. It's also something that can be done in the clinic. It can be done by the urologist or the radiologist in their, in their clinic without the 
you know, the kind of resource implications of MRI. So that's part of the appeal. It's got a small footprint. It looks like every other ultrasound. It doesn't look like anything special. I say to patients, this is the Lamborghini of ultrasound devices. And, and they look at it like, you know, what are you talking about? But I really believe that. So that's the first thing is the related to the benefits of ultrasound compared to MRI in terms of cost and accessibility. And then the other is the performance. And uh, what, what, what is becoming clear, I would say, is that the sensitivity looks comparable, but there's clearly cases where the MRI is negative, the microultrasound is positive, and vice versa. So, uh, uh, so I think as a kind of an adjunct to MRI, uh, it, it really <clears throat> has a potential role. So, uh, and then the, the part of that too is, it's a one-stop technology, whereas with MRI, it's become fairly complex. The patient has the imaging with the MRI, then has the, the registration by the radiologist who hopefully is experienced, but you know, there's, there's data that really um, inexperienced MRI, uh, readers of prostate MRI can be a problem. And then the, the um, fusion targeting, which may be done by a second practitioner, the patient has to come back for that. So all in all, it's a pretty cumbersome algorithm, whereas with this, you know, patient comes, ultrasound, there's the lesion, biopsy, one-stop shopping. So that's quite appealing to patients. So I think those are kind of two or three areas where it has some potential advantages. Excellent. Well, then thinking about, I guess, the day-to-day the -day approach for providers when it comes to prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment, and you kind of walked through this to, to an extent, but are there other things that providers should anticipate on how microultrasound can change what they, they will do on that day-to-day -day basis when it comes to these patients? Well, so I think it's got a lot of uh, potential kind of practice-changing attributes. So one is the, the, the very common scenario, which every practitioner sees every week, you see a patient who's got moderate elevation of his PSA. So, you know, the upper limit of PSA, we use age adjusted norms and so on. It's typically in the range of four or so, three to five. Uh, we take other parameters into, into account. I use computer-based risk algorithms routinely to kind of get a sense. But you have a patient who say got an 8% chance of high-grade prostate cancer based on the nomograms. So he's kind of in the gray zone for biopsy. And what's appealing is to bring the patient in for just an ultrasound, particularly if he's in the region, doesn't have to travel too far, bring him in for an ultrasound. If that ultrasound is negative, and you can do the same with MRI, but at least in my world, this is much more accessible. If the MRI is negative, his risk of significant cancer drops from 8% to around 2%. So at that level, you can say, listen, it's never 100%, but your chance of significant cancer is so low, we don't have to do anything further. And by the same token, if you see a lesion, then you bring him back with the antibiotic prep and enema and so on and biopsy it. Um, that way, and you can do you can use MRI the same way, but um, the the other the other thing is you know from a cost perspective, from a there's no contrast required, there's no gadolinium, uh, there's there's uh, so it, it really uh, claustrophobia is an issue for a lot of guys. I can't get over how many big robust men do not want to go back in that court. So, so it's kind of uh, as an accessible, relatively inexpensive way to identify patients who shouldn't have, and should not have a biopsy. It's really been, it's really changed my practice quite a bit over the last year or two. And then, um, you know, then there's, I mean, we also use it in conjunction with MRI. So the patient has an MRI, he has a target. We 
bring him back, we do the ultrasound, we can usually see the target on MRI, particularly once, once it's identified. Now, one of the limitations of the data on the sensitivity of microultrasound to date is that the practitioners were not rigorously blinded to the MRI. So you can imagine you see the MRI and then you look at the ultrasound it's, it's, a, it's a, you can convince yourself that there's a lesion there. Uh, now we're doing it blinded to the MRI. So we look at the ultrasound first, annotate it, and only then review the MRI just because we're, we're very committed to getting good solid data on how this performs to compared to MRI. And I think that's a, that's a, uh, uh, potential, that's a real limitation of the data that is out there so far. Uh, I can tell you we've just, we've just done the analysis on the first 100 or so patients who were blinded to the MRI and the sensitivity data has stood up. So it really looks quite, quite comparable. Um, and then for follow-up, so you know you can do uh, you can do annual ultrasound in a way that is that at least for us is quite cumbersome with MRI. Where you know if I were to order annual MRIs, be some pushback. Different different environment in Canada compared to United States, where uh, I think the issue of being responsible stewards of the limited resource is much more a factor in Canada. But I would be if, if I ordered annual MRIs on every one of my patients on active surveillance, for example, because we have about 1,500 patients on surveillance, it would, it would have a major impact on the available resource. So this way we can do either ultrasound every year or two or alternate it with MRI. It's really been a very nice alternative. Right. Well, then turning to this study in particular, um, kind of walk us through the, the design of it, what you analyzed, what the, the goals were, and, and the intent, intent behind it. So this, this was a registry of 11 sites, international sites from, I think, uh, six or seven different countries, uh, Europe, United States, Canada. Uh, and this was these were early adopters of the technology, and this was really a way to try and integrate their initial experience. And the, the, the only selection was that these were cases who had had an MRI prior to the ultrasound, so we could compare. And again, you know, the limitation was this was, not, this was a prospective registry, but it wasn't a rigorous trial designed to see how it performed blinded to the MRI. These were, these were practitioners basically learning how to use the technology and seeing how well it, it worked in their hands. But the surprising thing I would say, given that they were new to the technology, it reflects the learning curve unequivocally, it performed pretty damn well. The, the sensitivity was actually superior to MRI, which I would not have expected necessarily. And I, I uh, again, with the caveats I've mentioned, but what it, it told us was this, this really works, that you, you see the lesions and you biopsy them and you are finding uh, as much significant cancer pretty much as you do with MRI. Right. Now, as far as the, the specific results, talking about that specificity and, and sensitivity, are there um, certain numbers that we can put around that to kind of give people an idea of the, the performance of microultrasound when compared to MRI? This, um, this analysis showed that the sensitivity was somewhere around 90% for both MRI and microultrasound. This is for grade group two cancer. The specificity was around 20 to 25% for both. So, uh, and the, the positive predictive value, 43% for both, the negative predictive value around 75 to 85% for both. So that's what our data showed. And, you know, it needs to be validated. Uh, it's an early experience, it's the learning curve, uh, the, the you know, the issue of blinding is very significant. 
And I also think um, just with respect to the learning curve, we have some data that the learning curve for sensitivity is, is quite short. So it doesn't take long to learn what cancer looks like and to identify it and to biopsy it, to learn how to biopsy it. It takes, it takes maybe a, a month or two of experience with 15 or 20 cases and people can start to recognize this. It's actually quite reassuring. I think where the learning curve is longer is the specificity issue. So it takes a lot more confidence to be able to say, yes, there's something there that isn't quite normal, but I know from experience that is not cancer. We don't have to biopsy it. So the, in the blinded analysis that we've done, the specificity was lower than MRI. And I think that reflects the fact that we were anxious basically to biopsy every, everything that looks suspicious. Going forward now, I know I personally am more selective about what I biopsy. I feel more confident saying, you know, that little thing there is, has a low predictive value for cancer. And, and that probably, like any expertise, you know, there's kind of a rapid acquisition of the basic skills, and then it takes longer to get the nuance. But, but in this area, I, I really think it's the, it's the sensitivity that counts because what you want is not to miss a significant cancer. Uh, the specificity issue means you may be doing a few more biopsies than necessary. And, you know, the downside risk of that is modest. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in particular, also the, the negative predictive value really speaks to that. Yeah. Uh, to Dr. Klotz's point. And in, in this particular study, uh, the negative predictive value was modestly higher than the MRI, about 85% right. to 77%. So I think that is promising and, and we hope that it'll hold up uh, in the, the blinded studies as well. Excellent. Well, then, you know, you mentioned confidence in one regard, but, you know, speaking to, I guess, confidence of, of providers, given these results, you know, what can we keep, what can we tell providers about how, um, how sure they can feel about these, um, these findings in, in a generalizable population? So, you know, here's the thing, MRI, there's experience with tens of thousands of patients. Uh, we have multiple prospective randomized prospective trials comparing MRI to systematic biopsy. So like anytime you have a new technology, uh, this, this, the, the registry that we report is based on something like um, 1,500 patients. For, for, and that's pretty much it for the world experience that's reported so far. So yes, it, you know, it needs validation. But I think the, you know, the benefits to me are so transparently obvious. And the fact that the, these metrics are only gonna improve because they represent a learning curve. Um, so I think uh, certainly for, for practitioners who are interested in prostatic ultrasound, they should give a very hard look at this because I really think it's a, it's a better mousetrap. The, the high resolution really offers very substantial benefits. You know, Conventional ultrasound is good for imaging the prostate, but not good for imaging prostate cancer. And folks like me never look to it for that. We would, you know, once in a while you might see a lesion, which turned out usually to be a huge high grade cancer. Uh, now you can actually see it with, with high level of sensitivity. So, you know, it's very exciting. All right. Well, as we move forward and, you know, like you said, this, you know, requires validation and, and further research, but ultimately from a, a much more widespread and 50,000 foot perspective, I guess we can say, what do you hope the clinical impact will ultimately be of introducing micro ultrasound into the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer? Well, I, I think it will, it, it, it's clearly um, kind of parallel to MRI. It's not going to replace MRI. MRI has been a huge advance. But, you know, uh, as I mentioned, it has its limitations. First of all, it misses cancers, probably 15% of significant cancers, depending on the patient's risk category. And then there's all the issues about uh, accessibility and cost. So I see this as really an adjunct. It's going to, my prediction is it will replace a lot of MRIs, but it's certainly not going to replace MRI completely, 
There's, there's uh, um, one difference, for example, is the ultrasound tends to be a real-time technology. You know, you, you are looking at the image while you're doing it. MRI is kind of uh, the radiologist coming in and looking in a much more, uh, you know, uh, kind of can, can look in a more, uh, uh, can really scrutinize the images with great care after the fact. So there's an element of uh, close analysis that's possible with MRI that I think tends not to happen with ultrasound, and that that is one of the advantages. And of course, MRI is evolving too. There's a whole lot of you know radio genomics involved in MRI. The same may be possible with ultrasound, but I know that the the MRI field is is moving rapidly in that area. So. They're, they are complementary, I would say. But, um, you know, to, one way of putting this, you might be able to say it's like the poor man's MRI, but I, I, that's only part of it because it also has some clear advantages that MRI doesn't have. But, but definitely part of it is that it's, it's so much more accessible, less expensive. Um, urologists can do it. So, you know, it's, it's got, uh, I would say, a lot, of, a lot of appeal in that area. All right. Well, this question is addressing, or both of you, are there any other takeaway messages or, or points that we haven't touched on that you think would be important to kind of flesh out the importance of this research and the role that microultrasound will ultimately play? This is the, the registry of the initial experience with this device. So it's an exciting device. It's got a lot of potential applications. Uh, there's going to be many more publications about people's experience with larger numbers and greater expertise and so on. So, you know, all those things are relevant. But I, I mean, uh, I think they may look back on this publication as being one of the initial pivotal publications identifying the potential value of this technology. Yeah, I, I entirely agree. This is really hypothesis generating research that confirms that microultrasound has clinical value and that, that value um, may even be consistent with the new gold standard in the field of MRI. And uh, it's, it's a really exciting base on which to collect some of the new data coming uh, to look at how deep that comparison goes. All right. Well, Dr. Klotz and Dr. Wadlinger, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks very much. Pleasure.